peoples of the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Let the weaklings say, I am strong. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Bring down your warriors. What is happening? Our nation is under attack. It has been breached from the gutters to the pulpits. The pornographic plague is an epidemic. Reality check. $97 billion worldwide. There are over 100,000 illegal child pornography sites. Every 39 minutes, a new pornographic video is being made. One out of six boys and one out of three girls are molested before they turn 18. Child porn is a $3 billion a year industry. This generation has never known a time of innocence. The average age a child first sees pornography is 11 years old. In the next 24 hours, 1,440 percent will attend suicide. Pornography is a problem in the next 24 hours, nearly 3,000 teenage girls will become pregnant. Christian leaders confirm that they are struggling with sexual addiction, including pornography. This is the church that we're talking about. The church. Immorality is running rampant. Revelation 2 verse 20 says, I've seen your good works, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who leads my people into sexual immorality. The moral degradation of our society must not continue to advance. How could such a thing happen? Where is our indignation? Where is the church? We are in desperate need of a revolution, a pure life revolution. Joshua 3 verse 5, the Lord says, purify yourself, for tomorrow I'll do great wonders among you. Our indignation should flare because of the injustice that has targeted our children. It's time to get real. It's time to get honest with ourselves and with God. It's time to bring the hidden things to light. Jesus is coming back for his bride, his bride that is pure and spotless. We must stand up and be counted. There may be a day that evil overcomes this world, but today is not that day. This day we fight. What would happen if we dream together? What would happen if we believe together? Who's to say that internet pornography is here to stay? Do we dare believe that the God of heaven and earth can bring the whole thing down, collapsing down? The return of the king is imminent. It's at hand. We need a revolution, a pure life revolution. church is sick in need of God alone. The world is sick in need of Jesus. Before I get started much further, I want to read to you some more statistics. In the USA, the pornography industry makes $13.3 billion a year. That is more than the NFL, the MLB, and the NBA combined. Worldwide, pornography makes $96 billion a year. That's twice as much as Microsoft. $3,075 are spent on pornography every second. 28,258 internet users every second are viewing pornography. 42.7% of all internet users are regularly viewing. 12% of total websites are pornography sites. Every 39 minutes in the time it takes for us to go through a church service here today, another pornography film was filmed in the United States. The average age a child first sees pornography is 11 years old. 80% of 15 to 17 year olds are having multiple exposures and some are regularly viewing it. 90% of 8 to 16 year olds have viewed pornography while searching online for their homework. Viewers of pornography are comprised of 73% men and 28% women. 53% of promise keeper men, these are men who have been highly involved in the church that are pretty committed, 53% of promise keeper men viewed pornography this past week. 47% of Christian families say that pornography is a major issue in their home. It's not even to mention those that may be lying to try to have a better look. Uh, to look more Christian. 
As a youth pastor for the last 10 years, I can assure you that this is a giant in our land. It has continuously happened where I have kids who come in by the time they're in high school and confessing this for the first time. They've already got five years logged of being addicted to pornography. It is a regular thing on a weekly basis that we deal with. And, that is, and, and it would be dumb for me to assume that that's only young people. Reality is, men and women of all ages are struggling with this issue, married and unmarried. It is an issue in our day and in our time. It is a major issue. And here's why it's the most major issue. Because your eyes were made to see glory. Your eyes were made to view Jesus. It says in Scripture, taste and see that the Lord is good. You were made to see Him. Do you know about the seraphim in Revelation? Those are the creatures that are called the burning ones. They're covered in eyes. Every one of those eyes was made to see the glory of God. Your eyes, originally in the garden, all of your senses were made to come into contact with our Creator God, our Father. Every one of us, our eyes were made to see Jesus. Here's the problem. Satan knows this. And for a long time, he has tried to captivate the eyes. You hear of it, of these prophetic people, all the prophets of old. You hear of it in the Old Testament with Elijah. There was a day that happened, a woman named Jezebel popped up. She was a seductress in the land and caused thousands of prophets to get killed. The greatest enemy of the spirit of revelation, the greatest enemy of the prophetic gift is the spirit of lust. Pornography is made to take your eyes off of God. That's why it says in Hebrews, fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Don't go to the lesser pleasures. It is of severe importance that God wants us to deal with this issue. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 6.22, your eyes are the windows to your soul. Here's the question. What have we allowed to sit in the windows of our soul? What have we allowed? I'm not just talking all outright pornography. In some cases, that is it. But sometimes there's a light lesser thing that we have allowed, that have captivated our minds and our attention for far too long. I don't want anyone in this room to feel guilt this morning or shame, okay? There is no guilt. This is a shame-free zone, all right? But there is something that is called the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the way the conviction works is it does sting a little bit. It's like God presses His thumb on this issue in your life. And you feel it, and you feel like, oh no, i got to deal with this issue. And eventually, you go ahead and say, God, you can just have it. <laughs> okay? Throughout history, there's something, that conviction of the Holy Spirit will sometimes fall over a whole town. You hear of this story, conviction of the Holy Spirit falling on a town in the Great Awakenings, and like all the bars emptying out, and everybody like laying on their faces and weeping. You hear of it happening during the First Great Awakening, where Jonathan Edwards is preaching, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit falls, and people are grabbing onto their chairs because they're afraid they're going to fall into hell. <laughs> conviction of the Holy Spirit is a real thing, and I'm telling you, I am asking God for that here in this room this morning. It is a, yes, it is a little uncomfortable, but I'm praying for it because when conviction of the Holy Spirit comes, we can actually get free from things. Our God is not a party pooper. He's not trying to ruin things for you and make us unhappy, but He is after the wholeness of your heart. And so I'm asking that the one this morning, the one who sets captives free, would come in. The conviction of the Holy Spirit would fall, not just... You know, oh, that's not my issue. I don't care what your issue is. We're just praying that the conviction of the Holy Spirit would come. And He would convict us of our sin and we would get free and we would own up to our issues in life and find freedom and deliverance in Jesus and become the redeemed. Amen. So, let's pray. (laughs) That's what I'm going to pray for. Father, this morning we love You. And God, I ask You, even now, Lord, that You would open our eyes to see real beauty. God, would you even this morning cause your fiery eyes to search to and fro over this entire room, God, revealing any wicked ways in us. God, that we can come to you for mercy and grace and war against the things that break your heart. God, give us courage to face the uneasy and difficult this morning. God, I ask for the spirit of conviction of sin to touch this room. God, that we wouldn't walk in with the same issues we walked, walk out with the same issues we walked in with. Lord, I just pray even now, Holy Spirit, we say you are welcome in this place. God, we just invite you, even now, Father, I pray that hearts would beat beat quick. I pray, Father God, that conviction of sin would fall and that we would own up to our crap and get free. 
Lord Jesus, would you help us? Help us, Lord Jesus. Help us, Holy Spirit. Amen. There are two issues. We're going to be looking in Revelation this morning. There's two issues that John um, continually deals with when Jesus tells him to write to these seven churches. And the major issues that were affecting all of these churches in that day were idolatry and sexual immorality. I want to give us a definition this morning of sexual immorality. Sexual immorality includes all sexual activity, physical, verbal, technological, outside of the covenant of marriage. So if you are single, all sexual activity, including physical, verbal, or technological, is off limits for you. If you are married, all sexual activity, physical, verbal, technological, outside of with your husband or your wife, is off limits to you. Thyatira struggled with this. It was a church. And they struggled with sexual immorality. And in fact, they had a teacher in their land at the time who was very popular, who was teaching the people that it's okay to do what you want. In fact, it says she was leading them into sexual immorality and saying that it's totally okay to go ahead and live doing what you want and it's okay because God still loves you. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think that sounds like a lot of preachers out there today. Do what you want. It's still good. It's okay. <laughs> and that's the issue. Jesus has been speaking to me this week so strongly, this verse. And it's this. I'm about to make it our sore theme this year. I don't even like theme verses, but I'm about to have a theme verse. It's this. It's those who want to follow me must pick up their cross, deny themselves, and follow me. Jesus never said that it was going to be easy to be a Christian. How many of you know as a Christian that it's not always easy to be a Christian? Right? Right? I used to go to Family Christian store and there'd be this poster and it had a little sad face and, and like frowny, you know, raindrops. And it was like, my life before Jesus. And then afterwards, it was like, my life after Jesus. And it was this happy face with roses and things. How untrue is that? <laughs> I mean, seriously. I'm like, that poster's stupid. <laughs> it is not all easy once I become a Christian. No way. The reality, though, is, is that Jesus said, you must pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. I want us to think about that just for a minute. This is not really on, on my message, but I just really feel this is in, incredibly important. The cross. We have this image because it's so a part of Christianity. We've got crosses everywhere, you know? And we wear them as little necklaces and things. The cross, let's not forget, is not a nice thing. The cross is what Jesus was crucified on. Jesus says, pick up your cross. Not my cross. Pick up your cross. The thing you are meant to die on. He doesn't say pick up your cinnamon rolls or your chocolate or your flowers or whatever else. He says pick up your cross. Deny yourself. Those desires that you have, those things that God said are off limits. He says deny yourself those things. He doesn't say go and do what you want. I love you and you'll be in heaven anyway if you're a good person. That's what the world says. I, I just want to assure you Jesus did not hang up on a cross and go through a terrible death so you could be a nice person. He said, deny yourself. Pick up your cross and follow me. When somebody comes around and says this to you and says, hey, you know, you can still be a Christian. It's okay to do these things. Look at them and say, Lord, rebuke you. That is not, do not put down your cross. Continue to follow him no matter what. I want us to read from Revelation chapter 2, 18 through 29. says this, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these are the words of the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and your faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman who calls herself Jezebel and a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all of the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and the minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds." 
Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any burden on you, my, uh, except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give you authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery. Just as I have received the authority from my Father, I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In each of these letters, Jesus is telling John, write this down, send this to the churches. There are issues and I want to address them. In each of them, however, if you know anything about these, this chunk of scripture, you know Jesus actually reveals himself in a different way in each of the letters. In this particular one, Jesus says, I am the one with blazing fire. Tell them, John, I have eyes like blazing fire and feet like burnished bronze. What does that represent? There's some symbolism there. Jesus with eyes of blazing fire. Who has eyes of blazing fire? You can think of two potential things. One, somebody who's really angry. Right? Somebody makes you mad. I got fire in my eyes. I'm taking you out. <laughs> right? That is, there is one element here where you have Jesus with fire in his eyes. And I'm telling you, that fire is not directed towards you in anger. That fire is directed towards the enemy who has come and messed with his bride. Woe to the enemy of the king on his wedding day. He is filled with anger towards the enemy who messes with his bride. If, when Jesus comes home and he sees the other guy in there messing with his bride... He's going to take him out. He's got fire in his eyes. The other representation of fire in your eyes would represent love. It represents purity. It represents this pure love. This is what I'm assured of right now, and I'm so grateful for this. Regardless of the issues in this world, regardless of individual struggles, even of the kids that I've seen, God hotly pursues them. He searches for you. He is aware of your weakness and your brokenness, but he hotly pursues you. Some of you don't even want to be pursued. You're like, ah, I don't like God, I don't like church, it's boring. God is pursuing you and he is hunting you down. He has fire in his eyes. He says to John, tell them, I'm the one with fire in my eyes. I love them, but I am a severe God too and I'm going to come deal with this issue. He says, also, I have feet like burnished bronze. Burnished bronze represents judgment. Okay? So here's a God who says, I have judgment and I have firm footing. I have feet like bronze. So you have a God who says to you, I have fire in my eyes. I am coming with love and judgment. And I also have the ability to crush everything that hinders love. Everything that gets in the way and tries to steal your heart away. And ultimately, I have a firm footing that won't give way to the cultural shifts and changes that happen in our day and age. So first off, we have Jesus revealing himself. Next, he says this, I know your deeds, Thyatira. I know your deeds, your love, your faith, and your service. <laughs> and your perseverance, and that you're now doing more than you did at first. I mean, what Jesus is saying, just imagine, he shows up to this church. He says, Living Springs, I see your good works. I see how you're helping the poor. I see how you're serving the community. I see how you love me, even though you're weak. It's still real love, and it counts to me. It matters to me. I mean, that's what Jesus is saying. He's going and going, you know, I want you to know how much I appreciate and see all the goodness that you guys are doing. I mean, how many would love to hear Jesus come and say that about our church? You know? Wow, you guys are having huge impact. And it's awesome. I wish he would stop there, though. <laughs> but he goes on. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you. You have tolerated that one who calls herself Jezebel. You've tolerated. Here's the deal. In our culture right now, there's this word has taken a huge priority, and it's the word tolerance. And I just want to speak to what tolerance is, the goods and the bads. There is a good and there is a bad tolerance. Here's the good. Every human being, regardless if you agree with them or not, Every human being, regardless of if they're de demonized, if they're messed up on drugs, if they're in this huge life of sin, whatever, every human being inherent to them, being that they are image bearers of God, deserve dignity, respect, and love. All right? Every single human being. Why? You are an image bearer of God. And I don't care how bad and mean and stupid that person is, they are an image bearer of God. They deserve love and respect. Jesus would 
fully support that. Okay? Now here he says, I have this against you, you are tolerating something. So he, there's a wrong kind of tolerance he's addressing. And there's a wrong kind of tolerance. The tolerance that becomes permissive of all things. A tolerance that says, hey, it's not that big of a deal. Go ahead and live what you want. Jesus has a problem with. I hope you know that by now. Our Lord Jesus does not want you to do whatever you want. <laughs> He's called you to live a life, to pick up your cross, to deny yourself and follow me. And here you have a Lord who's saying, the problem is that you are tolerating too much in your culture. There are things that are not, that are off the list, <laughs> that are not permissible. And it's not okay for you to stand and go, oh, it's just fine, it's fine, the Lord loves you and it's going to be fine. No, it's not fine. It's not fine. Here's the thing I know by now, those of you who are gardeners, <laughs> or maybe not even gardeners, like me. I, if I go ahead and I find a weed behind my garage in May, and I say, I'm not going to do anything about that weed till midsummer when I go out there. What am I going to find when I go out behind my garage? <laughs> it's going to be a forest. Troy St. Victor knows because I pay him to come and cut them down and pick them. <laughs> Here I am, one weed. Now, you know what the Bible talks about when it talks about weeds? It talks that there's a parable of a sower. Jesus goes out and he plants all these seeds. And all the seeds fall in good places. But there's this one particular one. There's, there's birds that can come in dry places and so on, but there's one particular place where it says that there's weeds that are allowed to grow along the seed. And the weeds represent addictions and sin and issues we allow to remain in our life, such as pornography. Here's the issue. The issue is that weed eventually chokes the life out of that seed. If you leave it go without any confrontation, that weed can choke out the seed. Here's what I want to tell you. There are people who have come through SOAR and come through this ministry here, come through and sat here in this house that have allowed weeds to grow along their seed and have allowed themselves to be choked out. I've seen it. It's not hypothetical. It's true. You can lose that seed that is growing if you allow things to choke it out. And it is so sad when you see it happen. And we so want to think that we can dabble with a little sin, leave one little weed in our life. It's not that big of a deal, right? <laughs> we so want to think we can dabble with just a little bit of sin. It's not nothing wrong watching that, doing that. Everybody does it. Going ahead and dabbling in sin like that is like saying, how much cancer do you want injected in you? If you want just a little bit of cancer, is that okay? I mean, that's really what we're saying. I'll just have a little bit of cancer. Eventually, we, we want to think that we can enter into level one of sin and that we're going to just stay there and it's going to be okay. <laughs> Guys, the problem is, is we severely underestimate what happens when we do that. We end up with a cold heart and a seared conscience and we can't find ourselves out. We think, okay, I'll just flirt with level one and maybe level two. I'm not going to get to the level 10 stuff. Next thing you know, you're sitting at level seven going, how the heck did I get here? <laughs> That's what happens with sin. It is perverse. And it gets in and it deadens your heart, it makes you cold, and then you can't hear and you can't see what you were made to see. And it gets worse. It goes on, he says, you tolerate that woman Jezebel. Now Jezebel isn't the same woman that was in Elijah's story that I talked about. This particular Jezebel was a woman, she was a preacher, who was very well liked because she was speaking to the people she was talking to the people and saying to them, hey, it's okay, go ahead and live in sin. It's totally cool. Jesus loves you. <laughs> I mean, she's that person. Here's the problem. False teaching makes us comfortable in compromise. And Jesus wants us to be confident in his love and to pursue purity. And here you have this woman saying, it's okay. Now, I have been doing this long enough. I was talking with Greg St. Victor two weeks ago. And we were talking about this thing, that there's this little lie that people like to tell themselves. When the issue starts to get too close to home and they might have to change, and they don't want to change, what people do is they end up saying, well, you know, God knows my heart. <laughs> hey, have you heard that? So, you know, God, God knows my heart, you know, it's okay, it's between me and him. And we want to think that we can just, you know, the, the problem is, is this is not the generation that says, how far can I go for God? This is the generation that says, 
Oh, I don't see nothing wrong with watching that. I don't see nothing wrong with doing that. I don't see nothing wrong with wearing that. I don't see nothing wrong with going to that place. He's looking at my heart. He's looking at my heart. And here's what the problem is. What, what is taking place on the outside is an exemplified version of what is going on in your heart. And so those things that are going on in your heart are coming out. And God wants to deal with these things, guys, today. Even today. Why? Because he doesn't want you to give up on the treasure that is available that you don't even know you have yet. I'm not even talking about the treasure in heaven. There are rewards in heaven. We heard about those a second ago. There are rewards on this side. Living with a clean conscience. Tell me there is nothing better than laying your head on a, your pillow at night than with being able to do so with a clean conscience. There are real rewards. And God doesn't want us to squander them and give, them, give ourselves away to lesser pleasures like porn. I heard one of my friends once told me, he said, you get to keep the demons you fight for. What does that mean? Well, what he was saying is, is when that pressure comes and, and you, they go, Rich, you, know, you probably shouldn't be watching those movies. And I go, yeah, I, I don't see nothing wrong with watching those movies. I do what I want. <laughs> well, guess what? I get to keep that thing that I just fought for. <laughs> we need to have open hands. Say, Lord, whatever it is, I'm willing to give up. Because I want the treasure that is in you. Here's the next thing. It says that Jesus gave this woman time to repent. How nice of him. <laughs> he actually gives us time to repent. When we are in sin, he says, I'm giving you time to repent. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that sometimes when he gives us time to repent, we actually mistake that for him being okay with our sin. He'll give you time and say, you know what, I'm going to just give you time. I'm not going to talk to you on this. We're going, to, we're going to give you time to get this right before me. And instead, we go, oh, God's not talking to me about this issue. I don't feel convicted. So I'm just going to keep on doing it. And then we end up in this situation where he says, this woman did not repent. Now I am going to cast her on a bed of suffering. Another scripture says, I will make her sick. And those who have affairs with her, sick. Now, you know, some of you here are preachers, you know, right? You're like, Jesus doesn't make anybody sick. I'd rather go with what Jesus says about Jesus than what the preacher says about Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm going to make her sick. Why? Do we have a God that's just stingy and mean and wants to make people sick who don't listen to him? No. The reason God makes, is making her sick is so that she ultimately repents. It's God's heart to say, this is an issue in an area where I want to help you. And so I will bring trouble into your life so that you can get free from it. Do you know that God will bring trouble into your life? And oftentimes when trouble comes into your life, sometimes you go, oh, we have a mean God, and then we turn away. Sometimes God brings trouble in your life because he's trying to reveal something from you and maybe even trying to save you from something. You know, that relationship, I talk to the young people, that relationship that broke up, that boyfriend or girlfriend who's been sexually tempting you nonstop and you've been holding out, but then all of a sudden the relationship breaks up and the kid goes, oh, God is so mean, he broke up my relationship. Do you realize what God might have just saved you from? Years of shame because of the sex you had outside of marriage that you have to confess to your wife one day. I mean, seriously. God will bring in trouble sometimes. Sometimes, if the sunshine doesn't work, the good Lord will bring the rain in. I thank Him for that. Goes on, He says, To the one who overcomes and is victorious, they will rule nations. He says, I will give you the morning star. Do you know who the morning star is? Jesus. In the midst of a perverse culture that is fogged, with sin and shame and, and perversion. God says to the one who is victorious, I will give you Jesus. And his light will shine brighter than a thousand suns and be able to penetrate all the darkness that is in the land. I'm thankful for our God who loves to do those things. I'm talking about sexual immorality in general. As much as I'm being specific on porn, I want us to all know there are all ways that we can get caught into this culture of perversion. And ultimately, the Lord wants us to get free. He wants us to get free. About 
uh, six years ago, I was preaching at SOAR, and due to some of the students who were confessing certain things to me, I knew some of the issues that were in the room. Okay? So I knew that there were issues of several students who were addicted to pornography. I had some students who were having sex outside of marriage. I had some students who were like kind of in this area, and I knew that I had to preach this issue. And I was like, God, what can I say to them that will cause them to turn away from their sin? God, I know that there's got to be something, because this isn't okay. I'm like, God, what, what can I say? And you know what Jesus said to me? He goes, Rich, your words are not better than sex. It's okay, it's funny. <laughs> Like, they're not more pleasurable than sex, Rich. I'm like, okay, so, so what? The Lord says, but there is something that I offer that is. And it's pleasures evermore. It's fullness of joy. And you know what? This has struck me so deep. Because here I was, sitting in that place of going, hey, I'm just going to try to convince them. No, convincing isn't going to work. There's only one thing that works. Psalm 1611 it says, in your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Guys, you were made to receive pleasures evermore. You guys were made to have the fullness of joy that is in His presence. Here's why we struggle in America. We get bored spiritually. We stop seeking the Lord. We stop experiencing His presence and joy. And so we go to the lesser things and we find ourselves clicking on pornography. We find ourselves watching that movie, going to that club, doing that thing you're not supposed to do. Why? Because the joy begins to fade because we cut ourselves off. That's what Jesus talks about. Remain in the vine. Remain in the vine. What happens if I cut a branch off of a tree? That branch is eventually going to die. It might look okay for a little bit on the ground, but eventually it's going to die. And ultimately God says, remain in the vine. In my presence there is joy. More enjoyable than sex. In my presence, there is joy more enjoyable than pornography. In my presence, there are pleasures evermore that are more enjoyable than those things. And we have to seek them. Now, I'm not telling you that church is that. <laughs> I mean, if this is as good as it gets, <laughs> right? We might still be failing. There are pleasures, though, in His presence that are far more enjoyable. And I assure you that God desires to show you those pleasures and those joys. You have not tasted the best you can taste. <laughs> so what do we do? Well, i got five steps for us this morning. Start with what Jesus said to do. Repent. Repenting means to turn away from. It's not as simple as saying sorry and planning to do it again. Repenting is saying, God, I'm going to make a complete turn and I'm going to walk away from that sin. I am not going to make excuses for my sin. I'm going to call it what it is. It's sin. Then I'm going to go ahead and give it to Jesus and say, God, I repent. Then you know what happens? I hit delete on it, and I get right back in the race. <laughs> I hit delete on it, and I get right back in the race. Number two, we wage war on sin. We do whatever it takes to not give in to sin. What I mean by that, is I've understood in my life sometimes we can be really defensive with sin. And things like we might do, it would be like, okay, I'm going to put this big TV with all the channels right in my bedroom and then just hope that I don't go down to that channel. Or I'm going to give my kids an iPhone and an iPad and I'm going to hope they don't look at anything bad. <laughs> okay? There is... I'm going to do these things and I'm going to hope. No, no, sometimes we are playing defensively and we need to be offensive. And what that means is to actually take steps against, to actually wage war on that sin. I have a story of this. There's a high school kid. This is going to sound terrifying to parents who have invested in electronics for the kids. I apologize. But this is what happened. This kid was continually falling into sin and pornography using his iPad. And you know what? He couldn't t tell, figure out how to solve the problem. He went out with a rock and he broke the iPad. <laughs> now, some of you go, oh my gosh, couldn't we have just found a, like, a cheaper filter or something to put on there? Yeah, probably. But guess what? I'm not against this kid. This kid did whatever he had to do to get free. He took a step and said, God, no more. We have to be bold about saying no to sin. All right, number three. Confess your sins one to another. As James says, it says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. 
thing I've said often, you are as sick as your secrets. Whatever that secret is that you don't want to tell somebody, you're going to remain with that pressure in you. I want to encourage you to share your secrets. Get free. I used to love that I wasn't Catholic when I was a kid because I watched these movies and I saw how they had to go to confession booths. <laughs> and I would think like, oh, how terrifying. I don't want to tell them my sin. And I was like, I'm so glad I'm not Catholic. Right, Mom? Right. <laughs> Here's the thing. They actually, they really got something really right about this. We're supposed to confess our sins to each other so that you may be healed. That's the Lord's heart. Confess your sins to each other. Some of us need to find somebody that, we, that can be a safe person that we go to and say, look, this is my issue. And not just once, every time. And not different people so you don't ever feel the sting of it. The same person. And every time you make the mistake, you go, listen, I screwed up again. This is what I did. I need to go ahead and confess that sin. Please pray for me. We need this. We need to get back into a state of confession. I know we dread it. We dread it because we want to just talk to God. Why do we find it more comfortable to talk to a God who's completely sinless than our sinful brother who's right next to us? We have to be able to confess. God wants to heal us in that process. I'll just tell you this. When I was a senior in high school, I went on a mission trip here with this youth group. And I had some secrets that I had never shared with anybody. And I got to the point, I said, you know what, I need to do this. And I couldn't even say the full deal. I just said it first. I just got something to tell you. Because it committed me to tell them something. That's all I could do. And eventually I shared. And I got to tell you the freedom that I experienced upon sharing those things. Guys, it was joy that I've never felt. It was freedom like I never felt. We need to share and confess our sins. Next. This is a big one. Receive God's mercy and grace. Do not listen to shame. Your God likes you even in your weakness. Do you realize he called Peter the rock of the church before and fully knowing that Peter was going to deny him? <laughs> fully knowing your sin, God loves you. He knows that you're going to mess up. He knows that you're weak and he still sees that your love is real. And he goes, I love you. Yes, they're immature. Yes, they screw up, but I love you. There's an enemy that likes to do this little thing. Hey, come look at this. Come do this thing. And then when you do it, he goes, oh, now you can't go back to God. Now you're a filthy animal. You better put yourself in penance for three weeks. You know, you went four weeks without doing that, this thing. Now you've got to make six weeks in order to get back to where you were. Do you, do you know that? That's, like, that's really true. When, when you like, are free in an area of sin for like a certain amount of time, and then you, you fall into it again, the enemy's right there to go, oh, you can't talk to Jesus for another three months until you get back to where you were. Guys, that is a lie. There is no shame. Jesus says, confess your sin. Get healed. Yes, repent. Then hit delete on yesterday. It says He says, I will throw it into the sea of forgetfulness. And remember your sin no more. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far I separate your sin from you. You have a good God who loves you. And He does not want you to be underneath this lie of shame and guilt. Receive. Number six, get fascinated. He wants to show you pleasures that are way more enjoyable than that TV show, that porn site, or that romance novel. He really does. He really wants to show you those things. The, the key to this matter is getting over these addictive sexual sins is not just about gritting your teeth and trying harder. It's not about gritting your teeth and trying harder. You know what it's about? It's about receiving more of his joy and pleasure that is greater than that thing. It actually says in Scripture, it's his kindness that leads to repentance. When you realize how much he likes you and loves you, and you continually soak that in, you begin to step away going, you know what, that thing ain't all that great anyway. There's something so much greater. Well, this morning, one of the things I've done, I, I've created a, a sheet in the back. I want to encourage you to get that on the way out. We'll have ushers handing those out. But what's on that sheet is there's a purity covenant. It's just something that we've gone through with the high schoolers. Just some things you can, you can um, kind of covenant to um, just to continue to walk in purity. Some of those things include like filters on, on computers and some rec you know, recommendations for that. It also has things on there about joking, sexual joking. That's a really easy thing that we can do. Um, there's all kinds of jokes that 
pr primarily like one that comes from the, the, the show The Office that people use all the time, and you probably, it's probably a, an issue. Um, so there's some things that we could promise to. On the back of that sheet, I have books. It's not exhaustive by any means. There are just a few things that I found helpful. If you want to get some help in this area, there's, there's even a place that meets where you can go ahead and be with other brothers and sisters and confess sin and get free. There are things that are all on that sheet, so I want to encourage you to get that on the way out. The other thing I want to do here this morning is I want to encourage us, if this has been an issue in your life, to find freedom here. Now, I recognize that this is one of those kind of issues that, all, that people feel shame about, and you shouldn't. And so people don't want to really come forward and receive. Here's just what I want to tell you. If you have been in a jail cell for six, seven, eight, nine, ten years, and that door cell opens a little bit, and it's only going to be open for a little bit, would you really be that bothered by what the people next to you think and stay in that jail cell? Or would you run at the opportunity? I want to tell you there's opportunity. You might not come forward here this morning. But guess what? This is what's great about the conviction of the Holy Spirit. He'll be waiting for you in the car. He'll be waiting for you at your office. <laughs> He'll be waiting for you at home in your bedroom. You might as well just deal with it now. Because he's going to hotly pursue you and smoke you out. <laughs> because he wants you. And he's fighting for the treasures that are supposed to be for you in this life. Guys, I know what it's like. I'm telling you, how, I don't even want to give you the percentage, but nearly every guy that has come through SOAR has wrestled in this area. It is a major issue. And I don't want us to sit around going, oh, I'm going to look like the only one. Guys, we need to get free. All of us have been saved and redeemed from the table of demons. All of us have been saved and redeemed. We were all wretched, pitiful, and blind. But Jesus came for us. It is not an opportunity for us to sit and, and judge somebody else. It is an opportunity for us to say, freedom is available today. Where we can seriously say, no more shackles, no more chains. And we can find freedom today. And that conviction of the Holy Spirit would say, you know what, it's not okay that I go home and have the same issue without confessing it. I don't care what it costs me, I'm going to do what I have to do today. That kind of attitude the Lord wants to bless in the church. The attitude that goes, eh, I'm just going to keep this, then you get to keep it. So it's up to you. I'm going to invite you to stand. Once again, I'm not trying to make something happen. It sounds like I am. I just want to say this. If there is freedom that is available, I want you to take it. If you need freedom, come get your freedom. Don't wait for the next day. Don't wait till tomorrow. You may find yourself with a seared conscience and cold heart tomorrow. If you need freedom, get it today. I want to invite prayer team forward. If you are struggling with this issue and you're on the prayer team, stay back. I want you to get prayer. Either give prayer or receive prayer. All right? If you have been victorious in this area, if this has been an area where you have been, when I'm saying victorious, some of you go, oh, that means I never do anything bad. No, no. Victory looks like us making progress and saying, yep, I'm screwing up, but I'm continually pressing in. If you are making, if you are being victorious, I want to encourage you. If you found victory in this area, I would love to have you be on the prayer team to pray for people who need to find freedom. Then here's what I'm going to say. If there are other issues that are taking place, we're not going to just hound on this issue. If you need freedom from anything, if you need prayer for anything, if you need healing for anything, we're going to be here to pray for you today. All right, let me pray for us and you can receive the benediction. I want to encourage you and remind you to get those sheets in the back. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are the one who sets captives free. God, you are the one. God, you are more beautiful than pornography. God, you are more beautiful than the lesser pleasures of this age. God, in a sick and dying world where the church is dying in this very area, God, we ask you for your freedom to break in. God, I pray that you would hotly pursue a young generation and get them free, that their early years, their teenage years, would not be wasted in addiction, but God, you would raise them up as strong ones and mighty ones in this day and hour. God, I pray for those who are older who have been wrestling in this area. I ask you, God, come with your mercy, your mercy and your love. God, may your kindness and your love win for them today. So Holy Spirit, we just invite you, come and flood this room with your presence. 
I pray you follow anybody home who's running from you. That you would hotly pursue them. You would ambush them. And God, we just invite you even now, God. Would you come and set up your people free? That we can love you. God, and give you our all. And that we would know what it is to live with a clean conscience. With eyes that are filled with glory. And not the lesser thing. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We love you and we give you our hearts this morning. Now I pray for all those as they go. God, that you would bless them and keep them. God, that you would come and draw near to them in whole new ways. God, that you would cause their hearts to burn for you. God, brighter now than it ever has. And Lord God, that you would continually, God, cause them to run into you in the fullness of your promise. That they wouldn't give in to lesser pleasures. That they would know your nearness. God, and we pray right now for our eyes. God, would you come and clean our eyes? Would you come and clean the windows to our souls? And would you help help us to have our eyes fixed on Jesus? We love you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. We're coming to receive prayer.